Hello, everyone, and welcome. We thank you for joining us today here on Cannabis and Spirituality. It's an honor to have you joining us. I'm here with uh, my good friend and producer, co-organizer of the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, Stephen Gray, and we're really happy to, uh, you know, presenting what we're going to have this afternoon for you or this evening, depending whereabouts you are in the country. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to share with you that, you know, we are using the Zoom platform because we want to build community. We want people to have the opportunity to connect and interact. Uh, and for that reason, it's really important for you to have your cameras on so that we can see you, we can interact in our community. You guys can see each other. It's kind of like being at a real event where we get to see, interact, and we have the chat feature in Zoom as well. So you're welcome to chat. We have a couple uh, of our great Spirit Plant Medicine volunteers today. Donya and Casey will be here to answer any questions you have in regards to tech or any clarity on anything, but they're here for your support if you do need that. And if you're familiar with Zoom, that's awesome. And if you're not, there's a few different ways that you can use Zoom to interact. Uh, if you like what some of our panelists and our guests are saying, uh, you can give them a hands up or a thumbs up or an, a clap. Uh, on the very bottom of the Zoom toolbar, you'll see a reactions button. And you can choose reactions, you can pop it in there, you can raise your hand when it comes down to questions and answers. And you'll actually be able to ask the questions of our experts and panels uh, directly yourself, which is something that we're, we're excited to offer because we, we just love connecting. So we, we welcome you to today's episode of Cannabis and Spirituality, a spirit plant medicine event that we are using to, you know, just with the changing world, it's important to keep in contact and, and keep ourselves connected as community. So that is one of the reasons why we're here. And of course, to inspire people to find different ways to use cannabis uh, in a more spiritual type way. And we're really quite excited to hear uh, from, from our guests. So I'm gonna pass it over to our host, uh, co-host today, Stephen Gray, Stephen. No, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so um, just to clarify a little bit about what this is part of, uh, I just want to say that uh, this is a spirit plant medicine uh, webinar, and it's the first of what Mark and I hope to be a series on different related subjects to do with psychedelics and consciousness transformation. Psychedelics will always find a way into that, and by the way, you obviously notice that this is cannabis and spirituality so clearly cannabis is considered we are considering it a psychedelic so welcome and uh, I'm just going to tell you the format a little bit here it's super briefly just so you know uh, and Mark's going to say a little bit more about what's going to happen at the end um, a couple of gifts to hand out right Mark but anyway in the meantime I just want to tell you that the format is essentially three parts. We're going to have a talk by uh, the wonderful medicine hunter Chris Killam, and I'll say a wee bit more about him when I actually introduce him in a moment here. Uh, and then that'll be about a half an hour. Following that, we're going to have a panel discussion moderated by Mark and uh, with the panelists uh, Chris and Rachel Carlevale, who I'll also introduce a little later, and myself, Stephen Gray. And so that'll go on for about a half an hour. And following that, we will have a live Q&A session, as Mark mentioned, where we uh, hopefully, uh, if you're willing to have your camera on and all that, we will bring you up uh, on the screen and you can ask your question directly to one or more of the panelists. So Mark, before I uh, introduce Chris, do you have anything else to add? Do you want to talk about uh, we're, we're, we're hoping that you will stay right to the very, oh yes, one more thing by the way, that tech, specifically three major sections, but at the very end, if you stay to the very end, uh, Rachel uh, is going to lead us in a very brief, perhaps five minutes, guided meditation. And uh, believe me, I've seen her do this, I've been there when she's done this, she's a master at this. Uh, in fact, some of you might even want to have a toke before that happens so that she can take you even deeper. So Mark, back to you for a moment. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, as Stephen alluded, we will be having some gifts that we are gonna be giving away at the end and they're surprises. One is gonna be one of the cool Spirit Plant Medicine t-shirts that, that we love to share out there with the conference. So that's gonna be something as well as we've got a couple of other uh, surprises. Now the key to being 
involved to be potential to win because we have mm -hmm. a highly sophisticated technical device that will choose uh, who, who's the winner. <laughs> However, you have to be here till the end and you have to have your cameras on because if your camera's off and we call you out and, and you're not there, we're not going to be able to uh, get you your prize. And there, we've, we've got a few good good things for you coming up at the end. And again, you know, please make sure your your mute is, is or your microphone is muted. And if you have any questions, we have uh, Donya and Casey here as well to facilitate any chat or any questions, any concerns that you may have. That being said, I, I think we're ready to go, Stephen, unless I've missed anything. Uh, I think we're good, Mark. Um, and so, as I mentioned a moment ago, part A of the majorly three-part thing that we're doing here is going to be an address by Chris Killam. Uh, this is going to be a very brief and informal uh, bio or introduction to Chris. Uh, Chris is uh, also, one of his labels is the medicine hunter. He has spent many years traveling the world uh, seeking out uh, medicinal plants in particular, but other types of plants as well, and uh, writing about it, talking about it. He's been on, he was on a show uh, on Fox News or Fox Radio, Fox Television, I mean, for quite a while. Uh, nothing to do with their right wing mania. mania, mania. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was an outlier. Are you trying to distance me? Yeah, I'm trying to distance you from Fox News, right, that's for right, sure. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, anyway, uh, and uh, so he's just a wonderful voice on behalf of uh, of medicines, on uh, you know uh, cultural diversity, um, all good things. Uh, he's also a yoga master who's been doing this for like fifty years or more. Um, uh, extremely knowledgeable and experienced with cannabis, and in fact, he has a a, a recent book uh, which I have read. I know this book called "The Lotus and the Bud." It's an excellent book and very uh, uh, ap uh, applied science, you might say, very applicable. Take it to the mat. We've been, you know, humorously saying kind of. Uh, Chris is also. Uh, become uh, as close as you could be to a resident speaker at the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, uh, I think five years in a row at this point. Um, so um, it's, this is going to be good. Chris is one of the, my favorite silver ton raconteurs around. So welcome, Chris. <laughs> wow, man, I tell you, the pressure is on in a big way, Steve, and that, that's going to be tough to uh, stand up to. But thank you very much. And it's always a pleasure to... Um, it was always a pleasure to be with our community. Uh, one of the reasons that I, I love participating in Spirit Plant Medicine Conference so much is, is that, you know, when my wife Zoe and I show up, we have this instant community of hundreds of people that we've seen before. And um, I, I do, I think what you said earlier, Mark, about uh, shared communities is true. And, and especially during this time with the global pandemic, um, you know, we've had to modify many things about our lives, including going digital. And um, while there are advantages, you know, you can give a webinar and somebody comes on from Melbourne, Australia, and somebody hops on from Honduras, and that's kind of amazing. You know, at the very same time, there's a lot of the personal connection that you get when you're in the same room um, that we don't have at this time. So we've had to, in a way, it's kind of like building new neural networks with psychedelics. And I wanna explain that a little bit uh, because I think it's also applicable to cannabis. And since I often never know when I'm going to start or where I'm gonna start with this thing, this is as good as any. When we, um, when we go deeply with psychedelics and uh, by that we mean mind manifesting agents, um, what happens is that our typical neural pathways, habitual neural responses, which are electrical and are chemical, and in some cases are actually physically graven into our brains, get suspended. And new neural networks arise, and those networks give us new behavioral choices. And I've always maintained that the internet is the exteriorization of the human mind anyway. I mean, basically more and more and more, anything that you can find in the human mind, you can find out on the World Wide Web. And what I think we've done during COVID-19, in a way, as an interconnected global society, is we've created new neural networks. 
And yes, it's going to be wonderful to get back to in-person gatherings and being on stage, you know, and, and being in the audience and drifting around at conferences afterwards, having stand-up conversations. But for now, this is what we have. And I think it's been, you know, transformative and will carry a lot of this forward into time. In talking about cannabis as a uh, spiritual ally, I, I want to kind of lay down a, a couple of terms here. Uh, first of all, obviously, in this instance, we're talking about psychoactive cannabis. Um, I was fortunate about, oh gosh, 18 or so years ago to go to the central southern region of Siberia. And, um, you know, when I went to school as a kid, um, I, I think many of us read the little piece of propaganda that they give out called Weekly Reader. And Weekly Reader said that Siberia was like the most awful place on earth. And I got to the central southern uh, part of Siberia called the Altai, and it was mo one of the most splendid places <laughs> I've ever been in my life with unquestionably the, the pu purest air and the cleanest water of any place I've ever been in the world. Um, but the reason I'm telling you about it is that after the last ice age, so about 12,000 years ago, cannabis, which had lain dormant um, from its previous life as a pan-Eurasian plant all over the place for millions of years, it emerged about 19 million years ago. Um, when after the Ice Age, it re-emerged and it came out in the Altai. And I was there in that region investigating an entirely different plant, Rhodiola rosea. And as we started going into this region, I started seeing this other familiar plant absolutely everywhere. And um, we stopped and I got out. And as far as I could see in all directions, if it wasn't the road, if it wasn't a house, if it wasn't a tree, it was cannabis. And this went on for about 850 miles that we drove. And then subsequently, I saw the same thing all along the, uh, the Silk Road in Northern China, in the Northwest part of China. So cannabis came out from there and it went all over the world. And the psychoactive cannabis, not hemp, uh, which is really for cordage and fiber, but psychoactive cannabis uh, was really taken up first as a food. And I, what I think happened in terms of psychoactivity was that uh, people ate the seeds and the bracts around them also contain cannabinoids, psychoactive cannabinoids. And probably the first time that people really got high on cannabis was eating big bowls or you know, gourds somehow of cannabis seeds, either raw or cooked, because we know that for thousands and thousands of years, one of the primary foods on earth, and especially in Asia and Europe, was cannabis seeds. Uh, Cannabis is a camp follower, you know, people eat it, seeds fall to the ground, cannabis grows as people move around, it kind of follows us all over the place. But at some point, people had psychoactive experiences with this. Now we know that uh, are about 2500 BC, uh, Herodotus, the Greek, um, the Greek historian and, and uh, um, philosopher, recounted what, what really is the first account we have of a vaporizer. No, yeah, we think we invented vaporizers. No such thing, the Scythians invented vaporizers. But theirs was a little different from ours, okay? They, they, took, they made poles that kind of went in a sort of a teepee-like uh, formation. They wrapped them with thick felt. So basically they made a tent. Uh, around a, a fire, uh, you know, when the fire went down, it was hot stones. They would bring in armloads of cannabis, drop that on the stones, close the tent, get inside, breathe, get really high, and then go outside and run around and shout and have fun. Kind of like how we learned to do it as teenagers in a way, except for going into the tent part. The point is that that psychoactivity was something that people caught on to thousands of years ago. But at the very same time, uh, in China, in India, in Southeast Asia, people were also 
incorporating cannabis, psychoactive cannabis into rituals to honor the dead, uh, ceremonial passings of different sorts. People readily found, as we know today, that cannabis is a marvelous, marvelous sacrament. You know, I grew up um, going to church and um, I had uh, three ministers in my family when I was a kid and they were all lovely people. And um, I especially enjoyed hearing my grandfather preach. He was an astonishing minister. Um, but I, you know, I always thought that communion when I was finally old enough to have it was just kind of a little bit disappointing because there was this great buildup about, you know, taking in the, the blood and the flesh of Christ and all of that, which I respect the idea. And then basically you got a little square of Wonder Bread and a, a snort of Welch's grape juice. And it just kind of didn't make sense to me. It never did. Um, subsequently, many years later, spending a lot of time in the Himalayan hill regions, especially in the Kumaon Mountains, uh, which are all Shiva temples, um, I would be introduced uh, by different temple priests again and again and again to sitting with them and smoking some Taurus, the local hashish, and worshiping the god Shiva, listening to holy music, smelling the incense, enjoying the time, having a sacrament that delivered an effective experience of spirit. Uh, in the Hindu uh, yogic understanding, the god Shiva, who's a wild, wild god. I mean, descriptions of, of Shiva are really funny because Shiva is simultaneously kind of, you know, immensely devout, uh, but also wildly dancing naked, um, laughing for no apparent reason, being solemn, you know, able to travel all the worlds, multiply himself. I mean, a pretty talented, skilled god as the gods go. Uh, and supposedly the originator of the fountain of both yoga, the practice of self-realization through a variety of methods of, of physical culture and meditation, and also of cannabis. And early names for cannabis include vijaya, which means victory of the spirit, really, and also siddhi, and siddhi means occult power. So from very early on, at least in the uh, Indian region, uh, but we also saw this in other places as well, um, there was this sense that this was an ally, something delivered to humanity so that we could experience spirit more easily. And from that point forward, this idea has really taken off more and more and more. And at the very same time, that we have medicinal purposes for cannabis. You know, people who suffer stress, people who can't sleep, people who can't eat, uh, chemotherapy sufferers, glaucoma sufferers, people who get headaches a lot, and more and more and more. Um, at the very same time that we're learning about the rich possibilities of cannabis as a medicine, we also are now kind of really amplifying what has gone on for a couple of thousand years of traditional use in primarily in yoga, but also in um, Buddhist and some Taoist traditions as well. And now, you know, in Rastafari and in the uh, various experiential churches that cannabis can be employed, uh, thoughtfully applied as an agent to help us to more easily and readily apprehend spirit. And what in the world does that mean? Everything has an essence. Everything has a nature. Um, you know, we, for example, are spirit and flesh. At the very same time that we have flesh and bones and physical organs and blood, we're also imbued with enormous energy, uh, energy that is non-physical. Um, and, you know, the essence of everything, everything, every tree, every flower, every person, every possum, every cat, every dog has its own energetic signature. And that energy, that composition, that unique fingerprint of essence, that is the spirit. And as we get closer to an understanding of our own spirit, 
ourselves unfettered by sense of personality, unfettered by sense of time, past, present, or future, just free and open, clear as luminous mind, as, as Buddha would say. Um, you know, the more we come to a state of balance and happiness, a, a quote I've used a lot because I found it one of the most remarkable things I ever heard was that true healing puts into order the body, the mind, and the spirit with the past, the present, and the future. When you think about that, then you can also consider um, spiritual ignorance, that is lack of knowledge of the spiritual self or of the essential nature of things all around us as a true illness. And those agents that help us, that aid us, that are allies in our pursuit of greater understanding and greater, cl greater clarity and greater awareness, um, those are extremely meaningful agents. And for many people, cannabis is one of those. Um, as a yogi, I mean, I've been practicing daily for uh, 51 years now, so a long time. And, and, and I, I jokingly say, but I also mean, I think I'm a little bit of a hard case because I would think after 51 years of daily practice and medication, med <laughs> meditation and medication, <laughs> that I would be a lot more enlightened than I am now. Um, but such is the case, you know, we're all someplace upon the great spiritual continuum. But certainly, um, I've found that, you know, diving deeply into yoga practice and meditation without the aid of cannabis is very, very fruitful and, and wonderful. And I've done thousands of hours of yoga that way. But I've also found that cannabis is an ally that can work very, very well with yoga. Uh, Steve talked about my book, The Lotus and the Bud. Um, I had an experience I had many experiences early on uh, in uh, my yoga practice in which I also uh, had to utilize cannabis for different things. But my really, my first time that I got the absolute fusion of yoga and cannabis and cannabis as a spirit ally in yogic pursuits was uh, when I was in Kathmandu, Nepal back in uh, 84. And I went to a particular temple that I knew about called the Machendranath Temple. And it's, it's an old spooky temple. It's remarkable. The actual shrine itself, which is big, is made entirely of pounded metal. Uh, it's an ancient worshiping spot. And every night there's a uh, singing of holy music from a, a spectacularly old book. Uh, this huge old book and the people who sing these holy songs there have been doing it their whole lives together. So I went there one night and it was this group of musicians, middle-aged musicians, and uh, one took something out of his pocket and they leaned in and they talked to each other and the guy goes, come on over to me. And so I went over and, and I sat down with them and we all smoked together. And then I went back to a little spot to sit and they started to play holy music. And I very, very quickly and very readily went into a deep, deep, deep dive into a remarkable spiritual journey, a visual journey of, of gods and, and remarkable things. And this was just from smoking this Nepalese cannabis and being with these people in this ancient temple and listening to this holy music. And about every hour and a half or so, they'd stop. They'd invite me back up again. Um, we'd sit and smoke. I'd go back to my seat. They'd continue to play and I'd go back on a journey. And I was fortunate to do this with them for nine nights. And uh, I was terribly, terribly sorry to leave Kathmandu for that purpose because uh, the experience and the being there every evening and these lovely human beings and this amazing music uh, and the journeying that I was doing, which really was like journeying on mushrooms, certainly not as rough and as difficult as journeying on ayahuasca, but definitely uh, a visual, far out, remarkable, harmonizing, uh, deep spirited experience nonetheless, that really taught me about the power of cannabis properly employed. And I think that right now, um, you know, 
this is a, a somewhat remarkable time for us because those of us who've lived long enough have gone through decades and decades and decades where uh, cannabis has been illegal, where penalties for its uh, possession and use have been onerous, where people have been thrown in jail by the thousands for just having a joint. Uh, I mean, really absurd, draconian, hideous, crazy, uh, irresponsible laws that have harmed countless people. That's what we have grew up with. And now we have a much more tolerant circumstance and more tolerant globally uh, in the United States, many states. Um, you can buy cannabis as an adult uh, in my state of Massachusetts. I can grow it. It's fine. You know, it's, it's not a problem anymore. So we're undergoing a transformation. And I think we're also undergoing a transformation in terms of our understanding, not only of what this can be, but also how we want cannabis to work with us spiritually in the future. Remember, any tradition, any tradition you can name, no matter what it is, was made up by somebody. At some point, somebody said, hey, let's try this. Let's stand on our heads and do breath of fire. <laughs> And then they did that and they went, yeah, wow, that's really pretty amazing. And, you know, a hundred years later, what it's a traditional practice, okay? Um, we are creating the traditions of today and tomorrow. And I think one of the things that we're doing in a wonderful way, and I know you do this, Rachel, in your uh, ganja yoga, and I, and I want to hear more about that. Uh, but it, what, what we're doing is we're creating... Um, new ways of employing cannabis for the purposes of uh, giving us additional, I, I think, kind of spiritual amplification. Um, one of the things that's true about us as uh, spirit and flesh is that we experience both. We experience the spirit of who we are, and we also experience our physicality. And it happens to be that our neurons, of which there are hundreds and hundreds of billions in our bodies, every last one of them has an electrical charge of about 0 0.07 volts. And when you add up the total charge of the neurons that are in our bodies, it's millions of volts of energy. I can't tell you why we don't light up light bulbs and we just hold them in our hands. I don't know. But what I do know is this we can experience that energy, become familiar with how it feels, learn to amplify it, go deeply in it and work with it. And what I've found with cannabis in yoga practice, when judiciously applied, and I'm not talking about getting blasted because then it's just stoned yoga, but when judiciously applied, it's easier to go into the sensation of all of the electrical currents that are operating within us at all times anyway, and to learn to direct and to amplify our experience of that energy and to amplify the energy itself. So what I see with us is that in a way, this is in many respects, a brave new world. We are much more interconnected than we've ever been before. Uh, not that things are harmonious and marvelous globally because things are chaotic and difficult globally, but we are expressing this new neural connectivity very much the way our brains respond when we utilize psychedelics, uh, this neural connectivity globally through the World Wide Web. And at the very same time, we're coming up with newer ways to work with cannabis and more openly. Um, I've taught at many yoga conferences and typically what would happen is that other teachers and I would teach all day long. We'd have good classes, usually thankfully full classes, really rich days. Then the teachers, we'd all get together, smoke some cannabis and figure out where we were going to dinner. But we didn't introduce it to our classes because at the time, that's just not what was happening. Now it's very different. 
Now we can do that. Now we can figure out how it is that yoga, which spectacularly works on the human nervous system and activates it and enlivens it in ways that virtually nothing else does. And cannabis, which feeds the endocannabinoid system, a multi-system regulating agency that we didn't even know existed in us until the 1990s, and which has more receptor sites in our brain specifically designed to receive cannabinoids than any other receptors we have in our bodies. That's crazy. So we have this opportunity to explore this fusion, the conscious practices, the mind-body practices on occasion or often with the aid of cannabis to go deeper into the understanding and appreciation and sensation of the energy to be able to have an amplified experience of that, to be able to go deeper into the nervous system and to expand our sense of awareness. And the reason to expand our sense of awareness comes back to a simple fact. Everything is all one. The mystic experience, as it's really known and expressed, whether it's by Catholic mystics from antiquity or Hindus or Jains or Sufis or uh, people on mushrooms or people on ayahuasca or people on LSD, is a sense of the dissolving of the self the sense of the unity of all things, the oneness of all things, the inseparability of being, as this is one cosmic ocean of pure mind, or as they say, Satchitananda, existence and bliss, uh, really at its essence, once we calm down all the chatter. And I do think that uh, just as it was named Vijaya, victory of the spirit, and just as it was named Siddhi, an occult power uh, back in antiquity, that we do have, if we are intentional, and if we craft our circumstances correctly, a powerful spiritual ally, which is fundamentally friendly. And the great thing about cannabis, one of the many great things about cannabis, is that you can have a little bit and you can modify your consciousness just a touch. Or, of course, you can go completely to the other end of the dial and go for a full-on psychedelic experience. Uh, you may be familiar with the 19... I think it first, was first founded in 1918, Le Club de Hashishin in Paris, the, Hashin, the Hashish Eaters Club. And it was founded by some of the great writers of the time. And they would go to this club and they would eat this uh, jam called dawa mask, which was made from hashish and butter and pistachio and honey and sweet spices, aromatic and fragrant spices. And they would get rip snorting, absolute balls to the wall, mad tripping high. And they would have lavish, 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 lavish visions, which would go on for hours and hours because that's what cannabis, the psychedelic does when you have enough orally. And they would write about it. Uh, Fitzhugh Ludlow wrote one spectacular, spectacular, I don't know, six or eight page piece about seeing entire uh, empires and civilizations rise and fall in the time that it took him to rise from a seat in his office and walk to his desk a few feet away. Um, so you can also, if you choose, take cannabis to that far extreme. And one of the things we know about tripping, full on tripping, is that unless you're in a condition or a circumstance in which it's just plain inadvisable, for the most part, it brings people a lot of joy. And it also makes the mystic experience, that sense of unity, that sense of oneness with all things, remarkably easy for people who may not have the time or the energy or the interest in spending years and years cultivating a meditation practice to have glimpses of the same thing. So my conclusion about cannabis as a spiritual ally is that of the many things it can be, it can just be a nice relaxing hit at the end of the day after a long stressful day, fine. It can be, let's get high and go body surfing, 
fine. That's as spiritual as it gets in my book or applied to yoga practice or to any number of another of the body-mind disciplines. But I, I do think that we have a potent ally that can help us to more fully and richly apprehend the spirit within and without us. <laughs> that was great, Chris. That was wonderful. Thank you, man. Uh, Thank you. That, you are a master. You really are. Uh, that was, you know, that should be written down and put into another <laughs> book, Chris. I'm serious. That was great. Thank you, um, Stephen. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. So thanks again. Uh, by the way, that uh, the the uh, hashish club that you mentioned, I, I have that book. Uh, mm -hmm. It actually happened in the late 1840s, early 50s, I believe. Um, and they were some of the leading intellectuals and artists of Paris. Uh, Victor, Victor Hugo, Hugo, I think, was part yeah. of that. And uh, Charles Baudelaire was another mm -hmm. one. Right. Um, and, yeah. And there's some great stories. And <laughs> I like the one one guy, they, I guess this they went to this mansion. They had this kind of patron. Right. And uh, um, so they would eat this dinner and then put these giant balls of whatever that was you called it into their coffee, you know, and then sort of split up around the house. And one guy said he was con absolutely convinced it took him a thousand years to go up the central staircase. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And another one said that he was sitting in the, he was watching the fire and he said there were gargoyles coming out of it. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, no, that was wonderful. Thanks so much. And uh, um, uh, so I want to say that uh, uh, if I see that some people have been joining us during the course of this, so some of you may have missed uh, part or most of Chris's talk. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not fawning or anything. It was it was truly wonderful. It really just kind of put it all together in a beautiful package uh, about what we're talking about with cannabis as a spiritual ally, and and so Chris, uh, if you if you didn't if you weren't clear on the format or if you just came in, uh, there are two more parts to this webinar today. One is uh, the next one is another half hour or so of a panel discussion with Chris. Rachel Carlevale and myself, and I'm going to say a little bit about Rachel in a second here. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, Mar well, and Mark Caron here, our, our lovely Mark is going to moderate that discussion. And then once that's finished, we're going to open it up for a live Q&A session. Uh, if you are, as Mark has said, and we'll probably remind you again, if you put your camera on, uh, you will be able to be live on the screen and directly ask one of the panelists uh, or all of us uh, a question. And then as a, as a f wonderful little roundup to the whole thing, uh, uh, Rachel is going to, uh, I don't know which will come first. I'll leave that to Mark. Either Mark's going to give away a few gifts only to those people that stick around to the very end. <laughs> uh, and then maybe, I don't know, you can decide, Mark, uh, maybe the, a good way to end it would be rather than do that, let Rachel do this wonderful little guided meditation uh, to send people, uh, I think Chris said on their uh, trippy cosmic merry way or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, I'm, in a moment, I'm going to turn it back over to Mark uh, to moderate that discussion. But before that, I want to introduce Rachel. Uh, you may be able to see her on the screen. Yes, there she is. And uh, I'm not going to say much about her because Mark is actually, I believe, going to ask Rachel to say a little bit about her work and so on. So I'm just going to say that uh, she's been working with cannabis for quite a while. She founded and runs an organization called Ganjasana. Um, which, as you can imagine, if you know the term asana, is a yoga posture. So it's a mixture of cannabis and yoga. She's a, uh, you know, she's a communicator, an educator, a healer, a ceremonial leader, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, doing wonderful work with that plant. And so she will be one of the three panelists. And uh, I won't say anything about myself. I'm Stephen Gray, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I will be one of the others. And the other one will be Chris. Killam, who you just heard, hopefully heard give this amazing address on cannabis as a spiritual ally. So I don't think I've forgotten anything important, and I will now turn it back to uh, Mark Caron, but actually I just want to say something about Mark, because Mark never introduces himself particularly, or he doesn't toot his own horn. So I just want to say that uh, Mark and I have been working for the last three years or so, co-partnering as organizers of the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, 
Uh, Mark also has gotten more and more involved in the whole sort of world of psychedelics. He's got a new, uh, I don't know if you call it a podcast or what, Mark. Uh, he actually interviewed me uh, yesterday, um, something called Psychedelic World. He also works with uh, Conscious Living Radio. They put on programs. He's got a few things going, and it's just developing all the time. He's becoming a what I would call a, a major player in this field, and this is only going to increase. Uh, we'll, we'll just, you know, hopefully uh, he'll remember us as the little people that he knew on the way to the top, you know. So uh, over to you, Mark. <laughs> well, Stephen, first off, I couldn't have done it all what I do without you, and I, I do it for, you know, the love of the plants and the love of transforming you know, humanity, whether it be one person at a time or in groups. And I'm always grateful for you, Chris and Zoe and, and the support for the conference that you've always brought to us. And it's just an honor to be part of, of the work that we do. And uh, it's important for me to remain humble about it. But enough about me, because I want to hear from Rachel. Rachel, it's always a pleasure to see you. Uh, I love the work that you're doing. And, and maybe before we get started with the panel, you can tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you're doing with Gajasana. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And really honored to be here today. That was a, a wonderful talk, Chris. I was taking some notes too as you were talking. So always something to learn when you're speaking. Um, and for those of you who who may not be aware, Chris was my professor in college. And so part of my deep and intrinsic understanding from plant medicine um, came from my teachings in school with Chris. So really humbled to be on a panel with you today. And a lot of uh, my relationship with the cannabis plant and specifically really stemmed from uh, working with the ayahuasca plant. And so the ayahuasca was able to help me redefine my relationship with cannabis, which allowed me to <clears throat> bring back and revive this ceremonial concept of how we work with the cannabis plant medicine. And previously I had uh, started practicing yoga when I was a young teen, 14 years old. And so having this practice with me for so many years allowed me to really see and understand how important these tools are of asana, the way in which we hold our body and meditation, how we think and control our thoughts and pranayama, the way in which we breathe and how those are tools to really deepen our connection to the plant spirit so we can communicate, so to speak. So Ganjasana is that ceremonial practice of working with the plants. And I also like to encourage people to understand not just the plant medicine that you're working with, but the origin, the origin of the plant. So seeing the soil in which it comes from and the farmer which grew it. So I'm a huge proponent and uh, advocate for regenerative farming. And um, when you think about any type of plant medicine that you're going to work with, and even any type of food or anything you're putting in or on your body, having a deep understanding and connection to the source of those plants. So thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so honored to be here today and speak with everyone. You're muted, Mark. You're muted, Mark. <laughs> I got it. There we are. I'd like to make sure I don't have any background sounds or anything come in. So thank you for that. But Rachel, we're always grateful to, to have you be part of our community, part of our spirit plant family. And uh, Chris, welcome back to the panel. So, you know, uh, in listening to your talk, you gave me so much. I, I wrote down a number of questions, but I wanted to start with one specific question um, to get the ball rolling. And it, it really is what is it about cannabis specifically that makes you see it or experience it as a spiritual ally? I know we talked about cannabinoids and a, a number of different parts of the plant, but is, is it the history? Is it the experience? What is that for you that makes it really so sacred in that way? I think it's only the experience. Um, nothing else really matters with cannabis. I mean, it's wonderful to know more about the science of, of cannabis. It's wonderful to understand more about the 
pharmacokinetics, how all the various compounds in cannabis, whether we're talking 115 different cannabinoids or dozens and dozens of terpenes and, you know, 100 different flavonoids, how they work in the body. That's cool. But ultimately, it is experiential. And um, I mean, I found, I guess the best way to say it is that when my friends and I started smoking cannabis as teenagers, it was absolutely a gateway. Uh, we started eating natural foods. We started practicing yoga. We started meditating. We started wanting to know about herbs. Uh, we started paying more attention to the environment. I mean, things that we loved anyway, but it, it just was catalytic in ways which were basically tended us toward greater harmony and balance in our lives. And I don't want to suggest that as teenagers, we were harmonized and <laughs> balanced because that would not be an accurate representation of us. You know, we were very wild. But, but the point was that intrinsically, it tended us toward these things. And, um, and it was quite a bit later that I discovered that it was also deeply part of many long, long, long standing traditional applications for spirit anyway. So it was really the experience itself that delivered me to that. Great, well, thank you for that because that leads me to another question. And this is gonna be for all of you because first there's a common denominator in uh, using cannabis with yoga uh, between Chris and Rachel. And I know my experience in Stephen's ceremonies is, is different than, than yoga. But specifically, Chris, you said something that really intrigued me, where it's like, you know, if you want to smoke a joint, hang with your friends, do that. If you want to go, you know, smoke a joint and go body surfing, do that. That's really, you know, that's the epitome of spirituality for you. So the question for all of you is what, is what does it mean to be spiritual and what is spirituality hmm. for you specifically because I, I i i dig what you're saying chris about you know that body surfing connecting with nature being in the ocean being at one i get that but what is it specifically um if there's even an easy answer for that <laughs> my easy answer is that it's an ongoing awareness of the fundamental essential self uh, without, as I said earlier, without personality, circumstances, past, present, or future, just our essential nature. We, I mean, we are this. It's not like we have to go looking for it, you know. Uh, we are this. Uh, that's the thing we want to apprehend. And, and the extent to which we realize it, that's spiritual understanding. Well, whoever wants to follow Chris, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> he always articulates things so powerfully. <laughs> uh, so I'm not quite sure what I could say that would build on that particularly. Uh, um, maybe I could say, uh, um, combining your first question and, and that one, Mark, that uh, uh, um, one way that I like to think of cannabis is as a nonspecific amplifier. It's, that's a term that's been applied to the psychedelics in general. And so um, if you think of it that way, it's a, it's a, a tool uh, as an ally and, uh, and it's uh, exceedingly gracious. I like the old, uh, I think this comes from the Bible somewhere, kindly bent to ease us, you know. I mean, we have to do the easing, but it's this potentially, as Chris made really clear in his talk, a very, very powerful um, tool that way, you know, because it deepens, it amplifies, and then it becomes like what you do with that, right? Um, so um, I'm not, again, not sure what I could uh, add um, to what Chris said about, you know, what spirituality is, so to speak, and it is a big topic, I guess. Um, I guess uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's you know, and, and I, well, to be really honest, I don't think that I could do a description of spiritual awakening, full justice, because I don't think I am, <laughs> you know, um, but I've had glimpses, you know, uh, and, uh, and so uh, another phrase that I love, uh, also attributed to Jesus, you never know where these things actually come from, but strangely enough, considering that the Holy Roman Catholic Church has been trying to squelch wisdom for 2,000 years, uh, something has managed to creep through at the, two, the last 2,000 years, and one of them is the peace that passes all understanding. 
I think in the old St. James Bible, they said passeth, but we don't say passeth anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so um, there is this state that we, presumably, that's why I say, you know, it's a work in progress, right? But presumably the ultimate state that we could realize and dwell in and actually live in is a state of unconditional peace. Um, and uh, where, you know, w the, the turmoil that comes up in mind has come up so many times and we've watched it and we've, you know, uh, released it and we've experienced the suffering of it and so on and learned to uh, dwell more and more in the space around that stuff, right? Uh, then presumably we gradually land on what my old Buddhist teacher called was, uh, what is, you know, the natural state of things, right? Um, so, uh, and in that state, uh, you, you know, my, the same old Buddhist teacher, Chugyam Trungpa, actually, um, I don't know if it was just his term for enlightenment, but uh, it's, he also called it awakened heart, which I think is also a translation, and Chris would know this, of the Sanskrit term bodhicitta. Bodhi meaning I wake, I believe, and cheetah meaning both mind and heart together. Um, and that that's our, as Chris said, our, our natural state that uh, is our, in a sense, birthright, you know, um, a state of um, primordial joy, you might say, ultimately, uh? um, awakened heart. Rachel, I'm curious, when you're, um, when you're practicing ganjasana, um, what happens for you? So, well, to go back thinking about what is spirituality, I would, in a very short, condensed version, say it's present moment awareness. So in Ganjasana, in the practice, the way it unfolds is we show up sober, so without connecting to the plant spirit first, and work through different tools and modalities, so specific breathing practices, or um, mindfulness meditations that when we work with our cannabis spirit, we can then call on those tools during the ceremony. So it, it looks different every time depending on the specific genetic cultivar, but I, being a farmer, I really like to pull in the aspects of the where the plants came from. So we may do ceremonial things like meditate holding the worms or the vermicompost and so on a on a cellular level what's happening is we have marma points on our hands and it's active it's connected to all the organs in our body if you're familiar with acupuncture or acupressure you can see each organ represented in your hand in the soles of your feet on your tongue and in your ears and so when um and there's also scientific research that says it's now safe to get dirty be, and safe to let your kids get dirty because the microbiology in the soil is actually increasing our immune system. It's releasing serotonin in the brain, our happiness chemical. So before we even touch the cannabis, I like to have people touch the earth. And so I'll bring in the soil, we'll hold the soil. Uh, I'm not thinking of the word right now, but there is a word that describes the smell of fresh soil. Perhaps you remember that word, Chris, um, but it's really you're smelling the fungi and the microbes, the, the life that's there, the soul of the soil. And so in the Ganjasana practice or in a ceremony, we'll really start with those connections to the earth and find our breath. And what's most important that for me is the intention, the sankalpa of when you're speaking about Chris, if you're going to smoke a joint and go surfing, you know, that's a meditation practice, or I love to snowboard. Um, you're one, you're in the moment, you are connected to the mountain that could to somebody look like just recreational and they're goofing off. But to that person, it may be that the plant spirit is connecting them to the moment and they're feeling that bliss or that samadhi. So the ceremony is really set out to allow people to communicate with the plants. And I know we've talked about this, Chris. So I, I, the first time I sat in ayahuasca ceremony, I asked you, I said, is that me or is that the plant talking? <laughs> and I guess that's the great mystery of 
that divine conversation or the conversation with the divine um, understanding really what's happening here and how, but more importantly, the sankalpa, the intention. So why we're working with the plant and then how we can achieve those goals or that attention with our ally, with, with our support, the, the plants as being the support to help us get there. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that. And yeah, I think an answer to is it you or is it the plant? The answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Correct. I love that answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. So now, Chris, you said something I thought was interesting because I've had this experience with Stephen Gray about can if you're using cannabis as a psychedelic. So this becomes kind of a multi-layered question for all of you because it comes down to a selection and choosing medicine for your spiritual practice. Is there any particular cultivars, strains, uh, terpenes we need to look for in terms of selecting uh, a good medicine for a spiritual practice? And then, you know, as a sidebar, then a, a psychedelic practice because you did mention uh ingesting it for psychedelic and i sat with steven one time i had three tokes and it was a complete psychedelic journey for 90 minutes so i'm just curious how you differentiate the two because she well, is such a shapeshifter i mean you know i i think the difference between getting high and tripping is apparent to you when you cross the line and you're tripping um <laughs> You know, I think you know it. It's yeah. like, oh, I'm really dripping here. Okay, this is not the time to go skydiving. Um, you know, <laughs> in terms of different varieties or cultivars, I mean, I, I, I'm with Rachel on this. I think that, uh, you know, I mean, for example, I don't go into dispensaries here. I think it's pointless. I mean, besides the fact that I have way too much ganja that I grow myself. Um, once I saw the fine print on the label of ganja and it said may not conform to pesticide standards. I was done with the whole concept. Okay. Um, I want something that's lovingly grown. I don't, you know, if it's blue dream, if it's girl scout cookies, if it's Rocky mountain high. Yeah. It, if it's lovingly grown, that's kind of like the standard. Is it organically grown? That's the standard, you know, and then, we have our favorites. I mean, I really like Kali Mist, for example. I think as a phenomenal, bright, lively high, it's great. But there are, look, there are so many different varieties now. Um, it, it, there is, you know, in, in, uh, in the Middle East and in some parts of Asia, when they sit down to smoke hash, they smoke monster, monster pieces of it, coal-sized chunks of it. Now, if you do that, you will definitely cross the line, okay? It'll be like dumping an ocean of cannabinoids into your head. So you'll absolutely trip. But for the most part, people smoke, they might get outrageously high, but it's still quite different from oral consumption. So for me, assuming that you have a cannabis that you like, um, and you know it is clean and all of that, and it's in a form that is is readily digestible. So in the presence of a fat or an oil, somehow, then it's a matter of quantity. And obviously, set and setting apply. The one thing to know about cannabis, if you're going to trip on it, it lasts longer than anything. It lasts longer than ayahuasca. It lasts longer than acid. It lasts longer than peyote. It lasts longer than anything. So if you really, really want to trip on cannabis orally, uh, you know, get ready for a 12, 14 hour ride. Mm, nice. And, and what about you, Rachel? Do you have any particular favorites, anything you recommend for, for your practice? Is there a particular strain you use for ganjasana? Um, yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different ones. I always talk about one of my favorites, which is Holy Headband, the Big Sur Holy. Um, the, that 88 hash is another good one. Chris, you probably remember that better than me. That was around the time I was born. But uh, today I have some purple Skittles that were locally grown in Maine, all organically. But um, 
Yeah, I think a lot that has to do with it, echoing what Chris has to say about the way it's grown and who grew it. And also, it's great to know the genetic cultivar, what terpenes are present, what cannab cannabinoids are present. But with that being said, it affects each person so differently. And I know even for myself, at different points in my life, the same genetic cultivar can affect me differently, just depending on where I am at in the day, what I've eaten, my health. Um, years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. And so sur being able to survive that, uh, when we talk about the dose and, and what makes something getting high versus crossing the line into the psychedelic realm, that depends on you 100%. And that dose might change from one day to the next. So when I was really sick, I was in extreme pain. That was one of my main symptoms. I would eat about 300 milligrams of edible at a time just to get to a base level. And I, if you came and talked with me, you would have no idea that I was, ate an edible um, because that brought me to homeostasis. However, today where I'm, I'm thriving, I'm feeling very healthy. If I were to eat that much, I would be knocked out tripping super hard. <laughs> so it really just depends. You really got to focus on where you're at right now. Cause even if you tried a genetic, you know, last week or last year, it may affect you differently today, depending on your set and setting, which, which has so much influence on the experience. I can't stress that enough um, from having the proper set and setting for that particular experience. Yeah, Thank and you, Stephen, Rachel. Stephen, when you, uh, when you have the uh, cannabis ceremonies at Spirit Plant, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe people smoke a joint or part of a joint, or if they're at a particular place in a circle <laughs> where people come to them for help and relief, five joints, but, um, <laughs> you know, ultimately come back into the room and it's the magic of that ceremony that you put together mm -hmm. that does all the heavy lifting and takes people far further than they would go if they were to say, blow the same joint in their car. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, I think both, both you and Rachel have made that clear that it's set setting the intention of the grower, the love that's gone into growing, et cetera, et cetera, more than anything. And, you know, and your skill level as a, as the participant, as it were, to open up to it, you know, to surrender to it that, you know, because of this, you know, quote unquote, non-specific amplifier function, this plant will meet you wherever you are you know, able, willing, and intending to meet it, you know, and if you're willing and able to meet it at that deep level, it, it'll meet you there, right, as you guys have made so clear, especially you, Chris. Um, uh, I just want to add a little bit of something um, uh, in the sort of within the umbrella, so to speak, of that point, um, <clears throat> that uh, one thing I'm finding exciting these days, just from talking to people and reading a little here and there, is uh, um, we're, we're, I think we're moving toward a point, you know, Rachel made it clear that we are, um, we're all different, you know, I actually had a genetic test by this David Krantz guy, and he pointed out uh, that, uh, you know, everybody's genetics are so different for everything, you know, like, he and his wife went on the same diet. Uh, and she had, he lost weight, and she gained weight, right? Um, uh, because this particular chemical, I forget what it is, but it really affects your experience with cannabis, this particular chemical that we have in our brain, some have more of it, some have less of it, and that kind of thing. So yeah. that's the bottom line. However, actually not however, um, in line with that, uh, one aspect of where I think we're going, uh, you know, as a culture in our knowledge of cannabis, is that uh, we're learning more about the terpenes and their specific effects. And uh, so it comes down to, uh, you know, experimentation. That's mm -hmm. one of the wonderful things about this plant is you can safely experiment with it over and over and over again until you find the, the particular cultivar that works for you. But as part of that, I think it can be quite valuable. You know, I know, Chris, you said you don't want to go into dispensary, but if you can find within that dispensary um, connections to people who do grow the plant in that loving way and it's organic and all that, then we may be approaching the point where you can ask that the staff person, if they're educated, if they've done the work themselves, um, what are the terpenes in that plant? And then you can go home and you go, ah, oh, okay, this one had limonene in it, but I am a 
but I'm the kind of person who gets anxious really easy. So maybe uh, one with a lot of limonene in it isn't right for me, you know? Uh, maybe I need one with more myrcene in it or more linalool or whatever, that kind of thing. So I think that's an exciting potential growing edge. I mean, you guys could disagree with me if you wanted. I'd be more than happy to hear disagreement on that, but just wanted to add that in. No. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I have to say, I think the terpenes have even higher medicinal properties than the cannabinoids. And I know at least in a lot of the cannabis communities that I'm in, what, I've, what I'm hearing in regards to customers at the dispensaries is they're looking for the highest THC percentage. And it, it seems a little concerning to me actually, because there's so much more to the plant than THC. So if someone's looking to get quote unquote blasted, they're gonna want the highest THC percentage, which to me is mirroring if someone's looking at um, an alcohol, for example, and they're looking for the highest alcoholic percentage of, of drink that they can get. Um, so I think there's so much medicinal property in the terpenes that we haven't even explored yet in addition to looking at the full spectrum. So seeing what terpenes are synergistically working together in the plant. So I love that you brought that up, Stephen. Good. Wow, <clears throat> lots to, to think about and consider there. And uh, I can speak from my experience sitting with you, Stephen, the, the difference for me, and I think what I got from all of you, you know, the biggest common denominator is that intention and, and how we're using it. Because I know that, you know, if I smoke a joint and I'm just, you know, hanging out with my friends, doing something, it's a very different experience than if I sit in silence and I sit quiet and because I find I'm inside versus out there. Right. So. Sure. And, sure. and, and, and yeah, it, you know, as I said, experiment, find out, because the strain does make a difference, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I try lots of different ones, and there's a lot that, you know, certain number that don't do anything that I like, really, you know, like Chris mentioned the ones that we had at our uh, Spirit Plant Medicine Conference, and though that was uh, something called the Healer, which was uh, done by uh, Dragonfly Earth uh, Medicine, which is Josh and Kelly, and, and it was wonderful. Oh, yeah. And uh, those guys, you know, fit, you know, ch check all the boxes of proper right. attitude and everything right. like that. They do companion plant growing. They grow only outdoors. Um, you know, they love these things to death, you know, um, uh, all organic, everything. So you, you get you're going to get that, you know, as the end user is going to get that. Right. Yeah. And well, and I think it it kind of if I may, is it, it stands to reason and make a lot of logic and common sense and Rachel you really tapped on it and so did you Chris as well you know when it's grown with that intention it's grown organically it's done in a biodynamic way it's actually roots in the earth it's real sunlight uh, for me it, it only makes sense that that's going to be a much more connected plant teacher than something grown hydroponically under lights for profit Right. Yes. And there's an additional factor that we haven't really covered, but that in and of itself is a whole endeavor. And that is the spirit of the plant itself. I mean, cannabis as a plant in all of its forms uh, also has a gigantic spirit. And, you know, some of this is hard for us who weren't grown, who didn't grow up with this understanding, but basically, um, you know, what we know, I mean, Rachel, you, you know, you were down in the Amazon drinking ayahuasca with us and with some talented shamans, they work with the plant spirits. Yes, you drink some ayahuasca, but they're working with plant spirits and they bring additional plant spirits into the ceremonial space over the course of the night. And you feel that when they do. And the thing about cannabis is that it has an immense spirit. And so in that sense, if you use, I hate the word use, if you consume you know, one type of cannabis or another, assuming that they're well grown, if you can really tune into the the spirit, it almost doesn't matter, kind of like the way it almost doesn't matter what chessboard you play on. It's just a matter of preference at a certain point. Um, and I think that people can 
become familiar with and learn to navigate the spirit of cannabis itself. And even if that just seems like something that you're doing in your imagination at first, if you keep at it, you'll find yourself in this massive, intentional, fully alive, globally active spirit. And you can tap into that essence. And then I personally believe that it does matter somewhat less whatever variety or, you know, or strain you choose. It's just another key to open the door. Mm, beautiful. Mm, nice. So it kind of leads me into the uh, my next question, which, you know, now we're experimenting with different medicines, different strains, different cultivars. Is there uh, a risk for dependency, addiction, and then even you know from a spiritual bypassing point of view? And oh, I smoke grass and do yoga, and I'm all enlightened, and you know, and you know, is there a possibility of that? And and if so, how would one? How would you suggest one make sure that they're mindful that there's a balance there? Rachel, why don't you start that one? I would say, yes, absolutely. There's a possibility with any plant, any substance, food, molecule, there's the possibility for it to be honored and the possibility for it to be abused. Um, and when we think about how we ensure that we honor the plant, I, for me, it just comes back to the intention with working with the plant, but when I was personally speaking about how ayahuasca helped me redefine my relationship with cannabis, I certainly used to have an abusive relationship with the cannabis plant. I don't believe that there's any type of recreational use. If we're using cannabis to de-stress or we're using cannabis um, for anxiety, um, or, you know, if you're smoking at the end of, of your work day, it's still some type of medicinal property that it's bringing to you. And so when we think about a dependency on a plant, uh, it, it's what you might call an abusive relationship, um, where it's, it's a codependent relationship, right? And we want it to be an honorable and respectful relationship. So we come back to that practice of ceremony. And that for me personally was where the, in the teachings um, specifically with the Shipibo tribe and working with the shamans in ayahuasca was the very first time that I was immersed in understanding plants as a sentient being, as this plant is alive and able to communicate with us. And so once we, we as humans can cross the threshold of honoring the plants, then I think, you know, it's an everyday practice. There's always, a chance every day to drop into abuse of any type of relationship that you're in, whether it be with a plant or a person. Um, and so it's just that present moment awareness and checking in and coming back to this moment for me, at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Mark, I, I think in answer to your question also, and that, and that was great, Rachel, but I think also, um, you know, we can fool ourselves about anything in life, mm -hmm. anything at all. And people fool themselves more about spirituality <laughs> than almost anything, you know? Um, and we have the additional burden of fantastic stories that lead us to believe that we really should be enlightened, which is kind of pure trash, actually. You know, we're someplace along a continuum and that pressure to kind of measure against that, and I'm not saying don't hold you know, certain things high and, you know, in high regard and, and try to be that. I'm not suggesting that, but this kind of sort of background pressure for enlightenment is really a crock of crap. It's <laughs> what are you right now? What are you doing right now? Mm. Who are you right now? You can absolutely have an abusive relationship with this plant. You can absolutely have a healthy relationship with this plant. Um, uh, but I really do think that it is, it is actually a moment to moment. How am I going to navigate this day rather than am I going to wind up a sage on a mountaintop, you know, able to melt ice all around me? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I think the, um, the big problem in that sense, and I think you've just kind of alluded to it, Chris, anyway, uh, um, 
and this is from you know personal many mistakes or you know etc as well as observation is that um i like simple homilies and one of the fav my favorites is there's no there there mm -hmm. right um uh this is a kind of a core universal teaching that, you know, Buddhists, Buddhism has, you know, made a good job, done a good job of elucidating, for example, is that uh, when you're looking for something any, anywhere and, you know, any, any time or anywhere other than right now, which is what you, I think you were just talking about, Chris, that uh, as uh, one old Zen master, uh, Suzuki Roshi, put, you know, put it uh, in his wonderful little book, uh, uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, that takes you away from yourself, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so because cannabis is so lovely for a lot of people, it can be extremely seductive that way, you know? I mean, as you say, it can be anything. Um, it can be just this thing that we hold in our minds all the time. It's like there's some place we haven't gotten to yet, as you put it, Chris, like, you know, the, the place on the mountaintop, right? And I know that because I've been, I've fallen prey to that delusion so many times, you know? And in fact, I'm, I would say at, you know, this ripe old age, I'm still learning that lesson, that there's no there there, that it's just about simplifying the mind um, and just being, you know? Um, in that sense. So yeah, that's where one of the ways in which cannabis can be uh, a problem for people is that they're, they're thinking there's something there that they can get to and oh, this, you know, thing outside of me is going to get me there. That's what Buddhism teachings call theism. Um, right. That, yeah, you know, you know what, Chris, you know what theism means, right? It doesn't necessarily refer to God per se. It, it's the attitude that you... Um, that you are incomplete and there's something out there that if you grasp after it, whether it's, you know, it's just as much about money as it is about, you know, spirit. But as you say, the spiritual stuff is so tricky and so, you know, potentially glorious that it can be the most dangerous form of, of spiritual materialism that way, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Ultimately, you know, if we can be happy, if we can be fulfill, fulfilled, if we can do some good work, if we can share with others, if we can have friends and, and good lives and make a contribution, I mean, you know, that's a high calling. And along the way, whatever we can do to boost our joy that, you know, I, I, I like the word enjoyment. I think that cannabis is an agent of enjoyment. And that literally means something that promotes joy. And, um, you know, I think, I think that's one of the reasons that people turn to it more rather than to alcohol. I mean, look, alcohol is huge out there. It's, it's huge. It's dangerous. Um, many people use it responsibly. I get that. But um, I think that this is something that actually enge engenders more joy. And frankly, that gives people not only a good moment, but it also gives them hope. Mm. Well, it, it, you, in, in saying that, Chris, it, it leads me to, I can't remember, it was a number of years ago, and I was talking to somebody about their 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 kids, and their kids were, you know, in their early 20s, but they were saying, well, what do you mean you smoke pot every day to do everything? And, and he says, do you need to do that to do all these things? And he said, no, it's just better, <laughs> you know, and I thought, hmm. Uh, I can relate, so I, I, I can uh, kind of understand what you're saying in there. Now, he, you mentioned, Chris, as well, your daily yoga practice for as many years as, as you've been doing it. And is do you find a difference in your practice when you're using cannabis and when you're not? And if so, um, what specifically that might be? And same to you, uh, Rachel, after. Well, I mean... Uh... You know, I, I can practice pretty much anywhere. Uh, and fortunately, I go deeply into my yoga wherever I practice. So that's the good news. Um, I do notice an amplification of sensation with cannabis, uh, a more amplified, uh, easy to get to sensation of energy in my body. I mean, I can surely get to that without cannabis, but it's quicker. And definitely, you know, as, as Stephen was talking about as an amplifier, um, you know, that that is the case. And I like that. You know, I like the the greater feeling of energy while I'm working with energy, because in yoga practice, that's what I'm doing. Yeah, I definitely feel that as well, a heightened sense of awareness and sensation. 
And for myself, I practice both with cannabis and without cannabis. And I might kind of break it down to a yin yoga practice and a yang yoga practice. So yang being very um, vinyasa, fast paced. If I'm, I want to break a sweat type of yoga practice where I'm just going all in, that I do not incorporate cannabis. I find that um, when I work, when I am working with the plant spirit, I'm really going into a deeper yin meditative practice. I'm holding poses for, and if you're not familiar with yin, it's um, a lot slower. It's restorative. I hold poses for five to 10 breaths. Whereas a yang practice, I would not generally incorporate cannabis. Um, usually that's my morning practice. I, I spend about 20 to 30 minutes at least. I try to aim for in my, my dinacharya, my morning routine. Um, and I do that clear just when I wake up without incorporating any plant medicine. And so I, I reserve the plant medicine for an, an intentional way of communicating with it. Mm. Hey, Mark, I don't mean to, you know, uh, overtake your job here, but uh, what do you think? Are we perhaps ready to go on to the Q&A? Um, we're getting questions about how long this is going to go for. Uh, do uh, that. Absolutely, we can go to some Q&A, because I was exactly thinking the same thing, because I've got a list of questions here, and I don't want to be asking them all, and I want to make sure that we open it up to our guests. So what we're going to do, folks, is on your reactions uh, tab on the bottom toolbar, there's a little hands up. Uh, option there. It says raise hand. If you have a question you want to ask the panel, please raise your hand and I will uh, bring you in so you can ask your question. Don't be shy, oh. folks. And for those who don't have your cameras on, remember, as we give away our prizes and gifts at the end, in order to qualify, <laughs> your camera must be on. This is the leverage for your camera because we want to be able to see you. And if anybody has any questions, now's your time. Uh, to, oh, Dana West has a question. So one moment, Dana, I'm going to spotlight you here. And you can, you're, you're already unmuted. Go ahead. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Stephen, did you do the intro to Daniel McQueen's book? I did. Okay, so I just completed level one of sitter school. And I so we had sessions for several days and the last day incorporated a breath work along with um, cannabis. And to me, it had, I had never experienced cannabis that way. And um, it did feel much like MDMA or Aya or I did, it was it was phenomenal. So a couple of the small group leaders do conscious cannabis circles by Zoom. And I was just wondering, and one of them did ganja yoga um, training in San Francisco. So I'm kind of new to combining all of these things. I, I did complete the, the certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies and research at CIIS, but I am a psychologist. Oh, nice. And so I'm on this path and I'm, I really appreciate you making forums like this available. And I'm just feel like a sponge at this point. So I'm wondering a few things. If, if to your knowledge, I can put the ones that I know about that are happening by Zoom on, on a monthly basis or so, but I was wondering if you guys know, because I think that community set and setting, as you're saying, and intention and uh, skill set of the people, the playlist, the music was an amazing component. Um, but it's just beautiful the, to be able to do that with Zoom. And I wondered if you guys know of other people who are doing conscious cannabis circles these days by Zoom. Well, did I pay you to say that? Because um, coincidentally. <laughs> I, I, I paid her. I, I paid her, Stephen. Yeah. I, no, no, I didn't. Uh, yeah, more and more people are doing it. And uh, what I meant by that comment was that, uh, you know, just in two days from now, uh, Mark and I will be hosting, well, I'll be leading it. Mark and Mark will help me host uh, an online uh, cannabis ceremony ourselves um, through Spirit Plant Medicine. And uh, uh, we keep it simple. The format we keep pretty simple. Um, I, uh, I, I, I do some guided meditation with people. I leave silent sitting periods uh, so that people can just enter in without anything in the way, so to speak, and then do a little bit of sound stuff with crystal bowls and things like that. And, uh, you know, people have it, we all smoke at the same time. And it's actually quite remarkable. Uh, people in our sharing, we end up with a sharing session and uh, 
and a number of people have said, uh, it's, this has been a common report, that they have really felt the presence of other people. You know, you'd think online, uh, it, you know, you're not, you know, but um, it, that it's not the same as being there. And it isn't on one level, but uh, people have been surprised at like somehow, you know, that all these other people are doing this with you. And it really does affect people in a positive way. So, yeah, we're starting at 4 p.m. Uh, uh, Pacific time on Saturday, if anyone cares to join us. Um, I, so, I, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. And great to see that you're doing uh, the work that you're doing. Uh, Dana. Yes, yeah. I'm fascinated. I'm I'm super hopeful about the potential it holds to heal so many, like Mark was saying, whether it's an individual or a group. Um, shortly after a journey, I've been asking the medicine to be my North Star and asking to show me how I can serve. And shortly after a journey, I wound up in a breakout session of the Boston Psychedelic Research Group, which I recommend it's now open to everybody because it's virtual and I wound up in a breakout session with some filmmakers who are doing a documentary about the FDA clinical trials for MDMA assisted therapy for PTSD and next thing you know I wind up being the executive producer which is a new role for me and I just it came from a journey it came from a random breakout group and I I, I I, I saw written recently, I don't know where I'm going, but I know exactly how to get there. <laughs> so the path is unfolding and, and I'm just following each step. So I really appreciate you guys being part of my next step. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right on. We're happy to have you here, Dana. And I just want to let you know, I put a, a link to the cannabis ceremony on Saturday in the chat. And Rachel also dropped a link for the work that she does with her Genjasana. So the work is out there. And I, I just wanted to say one brief thing. And, you know, I, I really thank you, Stephen, for your patience with some of the crazy stuff I come up with at times. Um, because we started when COVID all happened, we were and kind of saying, well, what do we do? How are we going to do what we do next? And I said, well, let's do a cannabis ceremony online. And Stephen kind of rolled his eyes and shook his head a little bit, thinking I'm probably thinking I'm crazy. And he's like, you think so? Do you think it'll work? And it did. And the beautiful thing is I thank Zoom too, because they've gotten better and better and better in this past year, where we've been able to bring these events uh, mm -hmm. to people in a way that actually makes a difference. And the feedback has been really powerful. And I, I'm not saying just for, for hours, but you know, don't hesitate to participate in these virtual online events, folks, because mm -hmm. they really do work. And, and this is why it's important to have your cameras on, to engage in the chat, because this is how we build community. This is how we stay connected. This is how that energy transmute uh, over the internet and what I like to now call the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And when we're all doing the same thing and we're in a, a level of rapport, our, our energies do carry. So don't be afraid of virtual events and thank you for being here. Uh, does anybody else have another question? And maybe Rachel, you might wanna add to Stephen's answer for um, in terms of the work that you do with Ganjasana. Yeah, absolutely. We have really pivoted last year and moved online as well. And uh, honestly, I was a little apprehensive at first. I'm very much about not having any technology present in ceremonies. I make people turn their cell phones off, but look at us today connecting from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And since moving online, um, we hold our ceremony. We have a cannabis ceremony every around every full moon. And then also I do one for women only called the Green Tent. Um, on every new moon. And um, it's been a really cool experience because a lot of people who may not have been able to access a class in person um, are able to access it from the safety and their comfort of their own home, right, in their living room. And then also uh, being able to, to, you know, you're in Canada right now, Mark, and so it's really cool, I think, that this virtual reality that we're in, we're able to connect and talk about these spiritual concepts, and um, it's it's translated well. I think it's been well received. People can still feel the energy of the of the ceremony um, and really tap in with each other. And as you said, having the cameras on, it's nice to see people's faces and we can connect and 
build the synergy again, real, right? Because when we gather, when we hold ceremony, that's what it's all about. You, all of us together is more, um, it creates an exponential centropy than if I just sat by myself. Mm -hmm. And that's something I've always loved about cannabis is that it is the herb of peace. It's, you know, the peace pipe that we talk about. For me growing up, it's how I met a lot of my friends. Hey, let's go smoke a joint together in the woods. And those were, that's how I met my friends. And that's how we connected. And we would sit in nature. And um, so now we get to do that virtually, which I think is really awesome. Cool. Hey, Mark, I just wanted to um, remind people again, and especially if they came in late, that in about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, you're going to give away a couple things to people that have stuck with us and kept their cameras on. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, we're going to close essentially, uh, you know, including a slight thank you afterwards, but basically we're going to close with Rachel doing a guided meditation. And so some of you who are watching this may want to have a puff shortly before that so that she can take you even a little deeper or help you go a little deeper. Okay, Mark? Mark. Sounds good to me, Stephen. I'm, I'm here. I just had to unmute myself as so I'm driving a few things here. And we have Graybird has a question as well. So I'm going to throw you in as a spotlight and you're good to go. Thank you. Thank you, Say Mark. Say who you want to um, answer the question, please, Graybird. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mark and Stephen, for hosting this. And it's so such a pleasure to... Uh, listen to you again, uh, Chris and uh, Rachel. I saw you both, I think, at the 2019 uh, uh, conference mm -hmm. and such a pleasure. Um, I had a question, I had a question regarding uh, the spirit of the plant and the extraction. So, so we're extracting the THC from the plant. And uh, as you said earlier, the, the, the the goal is to get the most, the highest percentage of THC. And it's, it's my position that we lose, we lose the spirit mm. when we do the extraction. Can you speak to that? Well, is that true? Well, if you're talking about isolation, if you're talking about <laughs> isolating THC, about removing it to concentrate it, as far as I'm concerned, that's a fool's errand. Right. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Okay. Um, you know, the, I mean, it is now possible, and you may know this, Grey Bird, it's now possible to create THC or CBD through yeast fermentation and never even have a cannabis plant. No, so, I, didn't, I didn't know. Uh, yeah, that, and, and, and it's, it's wow. happening, it's scaling up, and that's all happening, and that'll go to, into beverages. That's not plant spirit. That's right. not the whole plant. That's not the lovingly tended, organically cared for, environmentally friendly, harmonious, smells amazing, gets your fingers sticky, your friends right. go, wow, what is this? This is wonderful. That's not that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I agree with you 100%. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I want to share something in addition to what Chris said in regards to isolating molecules, which bring us an isolate. Uh, there was recent research done, I believe it was in Israel, that was comparing an isolate of CBD cannabinoid to full spectrum. And they were measuring the amount of inflammation in a, in a person. And what they found was a bell-shaped dose response curve uh, and what that means is an isolate has a certain point of which it's medicinal for a person, a certain dosage oh, okay. point. Once it passes that point, it actually increased the inflammation in the person. Oh. So it became harmful. Wow. That blows my mind yeah. that, you know, when, we're, when we talk about isolates, it's generally someone who has to uh, respond to their shareholders and it has nothing to do about the spirit of the plant right beautiful now now Beautifully said. just just to kind of further answer your question about extraction a little bit 
if you however take some cannabis and you chop it up and you put it in butter or coconut oil and you cook it and you you know basically dissolve the resins on the trichomes so that you're getting all mm -hmm. of the terpenes and you're getting all of the cannabinoids and right. some of the flavonoids and then you consume that you know you consume that butter product right, right. Um, you've got a whole cannabis agent there you know, you can't, you can really have the cannabis spirit experience. It doesn't just have to be the raw plant, but certainly the isolation, especially considering that a lot of it's done with exotic solvents. Um, it's just a right. non-starter. That, that explains a lot because I was taking the, uh, the extract of THC for some time and uh, it, it, I didn't feel good. It didn't make me happy. Mm. It was a very heavy experience. Yeah, mm, sure, mm, sure. Mm, yeah, another piece of research I just want to mention is in regards to topicals, um, because topicals, there's, yeah. there's a huge uh, misperception that I've seen about THC. A lot of people who may not be familiar with cannabis or may be drug tested in their job for whatever reason right. have a fear of THC. So they might be more apt to try an isolate of CBD or what we call broad spectrum. And in essence, to make a broad spectrum product, you have to isolate all of the cannabinoids through chromatography and then put them, you take oh. out THC and then put them all back together. So it's a really intense and rigorous process. And topicals are another way in which we can use cannabis plant medicine topically through the skin, our largest organ. And some fascinating research I, I found was that THC is the carrier molecule that lets the other cannabinoids move through the transdermal layer of the skin to localize that those medicinal properties. And so if there, if you see any products on the market that is a cream or any type of topical that says it has no THC in it or THC free, it's doing nothing on your body in essence. So there, there's so much to be said about it preserving oh. the plant in its Mm -hmm. full spectrum form. And as Chris mentioned, with an extraction, in essence, what we're doing is knocking those trichome heads off the plant material. And those trichomes are where the terpenes and the cannabinoids live. Oh, so good if, stuff. Yeah. if you're doing a, a lipid extraction using some type of fat, like a butter, or I love using coconut oil, you're going to get the full plant material in that raw form. I'm assuming that's not what they're doing at, at the uh, at the shops, the can cannabis well, shops. I was say, you know, there are uh, there's a lot going on, but there are a few businesses that have excellent practices, are doing okay. excellent extractions. Um, you know, we mentioned Dragonfly Earth Medicine in mm -hmm. Canada. One of my okay. uh, dear friends is Ascend Cannabis Company in Colorado. They do all okay. what's called no-till living organic soil. So there, there are some registered dispensaries, but you got to do your research and right. ask the right questions. How was this grown? Um, what products did you grow with? Do you use pesticides, fungicides, herbicides at all in your process are some questions I might ask about. Thank you so much. That's a great answer, both of you. And you know, I, I think we're also seeing, um, which gets uh, relates to a lot of what Rachel was talking about, about cultivation. We're also seeing that even though we have this commodity market, which is going wild right now, and you know, cannabis companies worth $800 million and all of that kind of thing, at the very same time, the artisanal market continues to be very strong. Uh, artisanal growers who are doing all the right things are out there in great numbers producing beautiful products and doing it with love. So um, at the very same time that it can be unfortunate to discover that the market is awash with a bunch of distillates and isolates and products that yeah, aren't really as effective as they could be or as wholesome as they could be. Uh, there are more and more people saying, no, we're going to do this the right way because there are also folks eager for that. So I don't think that the artisanal, caring, loving, natural market is going to go away. It's just that right now, um, 
kind of the King Kong out there is this gigantic juggernaut of a capitalist, uh, you know, driven enterprise that doesn't really have that much to do with healing and harmony, frankly. Mm -hmm. No. And, and I think, you know, actually that's a really important thing for, for, to get out there, you know, to, that people should be educating and putting into the media and stuff like that, that there is that whole side of things there, that it really does make a difference, you know, who grows it, how they grow that and so on, you know, because a lot of people, you know, now that it's become public and, you know, most, I would guess the majority of consumers just in the general public are not reading research or any of that kind of thing. They just go, you know, go to the shop and get some, right? And they don't know what they're missing in that sense. And so I think it's really important that, uh, you know, as uh, I think, you know, Terrence McKenna once said, the best idea will win, but it has to be communicated, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, but, and, and this is a, a just a, a great example of why we do these kind of small webinars and, and why we want to do this, because the, the information that you've provided, Rachel and Chris, just in terms of the questions to ask when you're looking at, you know, selecting good herb for yourself. And, and Stephen was saying that as well in terms of, you know, the commercialization and things. You know, people need to know what they ask. All of a sudden it becomes legal in Canada. Now it's legal. Everybody just goes into a weed store and buys government issued kind of really crappy medicine, you know? And I think it's important to uh, give people the information to be able to ask the intelligent questions when it comes down to selecting, you know, some, some good uh, medicine for themselves. So, so thank you very much for those answers and that great question. Um, we do have another question. Dana's got her hand up again. So because she's so active, we are going to bring her back and we will have another question. If anybody else has any other questions, please raise your hand uh, because we're going to start wrapping up into our prize giveaway. So we're looking for some cameras on. <laughs> and Alex, this is a time to ask your question. I look frozen. I don't know if I am. No, you're um, good. Okay. A few things. Sorry. One was really quickly. If you also have, in addition to the webinars, a forum where people can exchange information because having the names of like, we didn't say where we're all from. I'm in the San Francisco Bay area, but when people know who's growing, like when Rachel just said her friends in Colorado, like stuff like that would be really helpful. And in the name of, of forming community, if there were a place to exchange that kind of information would be great. Um, Another thing was just like a little public service announcement when Chris was talking about the history and the, of cannabis. And I was thinking about the book, The Immortality Key, which I've seen the author speak a bunch. And if you haven't read that, I just wanted to recommend it. Um, it's like the original sacrament was psychedelic and, and he's finding proof in archaeobotany and, and uh, archaeo, you know, archaeology. Um, the last thing was you were talking about treatment for glaucoma. And I was recently diagnosed with glaucoma and you all seem so knowledgeable that I was wondering if anyone could guide me in the right direction as far as cannabis being helpful in treating that. Well, yeah, it's easy enough to look up. It's one of the, um, the medical purposes uh, that has good documentation. I mean, as you know, glaucoma is, a, is the leading cause of blindness among adults, and it, it's really due to uh, improper intraocular pressure in the eye. The actual shape of the eye changes, and cannabis appears to relax that. And there is good evidence on that. And if you uh, just go online and look, you'll probably find a bunch of things from- uh, I have, I oh, have. And so I thought yeah. such a wealth of information. I thought maybe yeah. specific like um, protocol or specific strain or anything like that. Um, the, only that people, might... the only people who've gone deeply into treatment specific strains with any detail and any large numbers of people are the Israelis and much of the work that they're doing at Tikkun Olam in Israel. Uh, okay. they have, they've actually tracked thousands of people with different medical conditions and they're starting to get a sense of what's working in terms of, you know, the THC to CBD profile and the terpenes. 
they're not there yet. But I would say of the people I know at this point in time, they seem to be far away in the lead because they haven't been dealing with decades of horseshit draconian laws that prohibit people from exploring the wondrous healing benefits of this plant. Exactly. So tikkun, tikkun alam, healing, healing the world in, in, in Israel. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, and I wanted to add um, about in terms of your question for community and network, uh, we were, were speaking a lot about Dragonfly Earth Medicine, which is Kelly and Josh up in Vancouver, and they have created a certification program specifically for both cannabis and hemp farms. It's similar to organic certification, but it goes way beyond into uh, what, what we call regenerative farming, where every single loop has to be closed on the farm. It's not a pay to play certification. So you don't have to pay to obtain it. it they truly just want people to have some type of standardization where the consumer can have a trust in a product that they're purchasing. So much like we have the uh, non-GMO butterfly that you might be looking for when you're grocery shopping or the USDA um, or, or uh, you know different certifications that you look for on your foods or products to know that it's safe for you. Uh, you know, we'll always have different types of consumers that some may choose to look for that type of high quality, safe ingredients, whereas other people might look for the cheapest product. But I did want to mention about those, um, it's called Dem Pure Certified. So they've already certified many, many farms. Um, I, in full disclosure, I'm one of their certifiers. So if any mm -hmm. farms out there want to get certified, I can come to your farm. And we actually go and make sure that you are doing a regenerative process. And so, for example, if you have butane extraction, you cannot get a certification butane's a carcinogen and we don't support any type of solvents so you really have to walk your talk on your farm to obtain the certification so i just wanted to mention that um community out there great Th thank you rachel for that and and i also wanted to mention if you're not already a member of our spear plant medicine private facebook group there's some community there uh so i encourage you to join that follow Rachel, follow Chris on Facebook and social media so you can be connected there because there are some great resources uh, out there online and social media. And uh, we've started a couple of years ago, we started a membership site in Spirit Plant Medicine where you can uh, have access and, and gain the 10 years of uh, presentations. And I've been inspired by my friends at Conscious Vitality because they actually have a back end social media community within their membership site. So uh, ironically enough, I had a conversation with our web guy today and it's something that we've put on the, the list to add into the back end of our community as well. Because, you know, the nature of this work for many people is, is private um and is, is of a delicate nature for legal reasons and things of that nature so i'm inspired to have a, a closed um forum and community that people can feel safe in and then it'd be specific to that community so that's something that we're looking uh, at doing ourselves and i would encourage you to you know take a look at the psychedelic societies and clubs and and things out there and associations in communities where you're at because they're a fountain of great information and knowledge as well so and if any, I was just going to say, and if anybody else has anything to add to community or anything of that nature, it'd be a great time to start segueing into making sure everybody's got their cameras on. Mm, okay, good. That's what I was going to check. Well, in our, 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 our high tech device isn't going to work if your camera's not on. So it's, you know, we spent a, a lot of money not on this device. <laughs> So what Mark's talking about is he's got a couple of things to give away in case you missed that, but you got to have your camera on for it. I know and we once... have 15 people in the room and we, we don't have that many cameras on. So folks, oh, well. I know. Well, you can give it all to me. All right. So what we have is Stephen and Chris have graciously offered to contribute a copy of their book. Stephen has Cannabis and Spirituality and Chris's new book, Lotus and the Bud. So we are going to give away 
a copy of each of those. We'll mail them to you. We'll get your information after our winner is selected. And uh, we'll also be giving you a, sending someone a Spirit Plant Medicine t-shirt, the coveted logo that everybody has loved so much. So without any further ado, oh, wow, look, we have three people, four, five, six, six, six. So our first winner for the t-shirt is Keiko BT. Bravo. Congratulations, Keiko. <laughs> and Dana West is the winner of Stephen Gray's Cannabis and Spirituality. And Gray Bird, congratulations, Lotus in the Bud from Chris Killam. And if you guys are even lucky, they'll autograph the books for you before they send them. Hmm. That's possible. We'll yeah. autograph them with hash oil. Then you can smoke the introductory page. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way you think. Chris. That's the <laughs> that's the special uh, rare edition infused version of the Lotus in the Bud, right, Chris? Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. You, you know, uh, I, I saw, as I'm sure you've seen in, in the old days, people returning from Mexico with uh, trench coats on, covered with mushroom spores. Have you seen any of that? No, I haven't. You know, it's, 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 it's illegal to transport the mushrooms, but it's not illegal to transport the spores. Mm. And there was just one fabulous photo of a guy in like a London fog trench coat, and he just had spore prints all, all over him. <laughs> the jacket obviously became the, the source for a uh, grow op. So anyway, mm -hmm. I'm not really sure what that had to do with anything. I don't even know why I said that, but thank you for being courteous. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's a great example of flexible thought. There's always a way if you're committed. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's always a way to commit. So and then Mark, sometimes maybe we should be committed. Yeah. Yes, Stephen. Oh, we're going to basically send people out on a five minute guided meditation by Rachel and then yep. simple, you know, 30 seconds of thank yous at the end, right? It's, well, I thought well, we would just kind of go out when the meditation's over. If you want to hang out for a little bit, but I thought we could do that now and then go into the meditation because depending where people are at, they might just want to drop off. Is that okay? okay. That's All totally right. fine. See, we're making this up as we go along, folks. Um, we are. It's, it's <laughs> being in the flow. So I just want to thank everybody here who, who came in and attended. We had 35 people sign up, and we had about 18 to 20 people join us at, at the peak, which is great. We've had a number of people watching in our private Facebook group, so we thank you for that. Uh, this will be available after uh, in our free membership area on Spirit Plant Medicine. If you want to go back to it as a reference, it'll be on our YouTube channel. We'll have it out there because we believe that this is really valuable information for people. And we want to share the knowledge so that we can help transform the world, whether it be one person at a time or a hundred or whatever it may be. And I, I want to you know, say thank you to to Chris again, always for your support and the work that we do and to you too, Rachel uh, and Stephen, you know, it, it's just it's been a, a pleasurable ride for the past few and a half years and uh, I've learned a lot I've grown a lot and uh, I'm grateful to be here. That being said, our, our goal is to do one of these every month we really wanted to grow because we love the live and interactive feature. And that being said. I am going to pass it off to Stephen Gray if he has any last words. Again, thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being here and bringing your energy to healing the world. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. thank you, Mark. And just a you know simple rephrasing of what you've said. So thank you very much to the participants that have joined us for this. Um, thank you, Rachel, and thank you in advance for what you are about to do as well, Rachel, um, and also. Uh, uh, Chris, uh, I, I'm not exaggerating. My feeling is that that was a really remarkable uh, extemporaneous, essentially, talk that you gave there. And folks, if you missed that, if you came in late, I would highly recommend what Mark said is to go, go and catch that talk. Uh, it, it just kind of covers all the key points in such an eloquent and uh, you know, beneficial way. So thanks again for doing that, Chris. Well, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Mark. And uh... Definitely. Thank you, Rachel. It's great to see you again after a, a bit of a hiatus. It's always a pleasure to be part of these. And, um, you know, I love the work you're doing. So we'll just keep on. Okay. All right. Take it away, Rachel. Beautiful. Well, if you are uh, participating in the cannabis portion, if you have your cannabis uh, 
today I'm working with a purple Skittles um, grown here in, locally in Maine in what's called indoor no-till container gardening. So it's all using living organic soil, no pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, anything of that nature. So if you want to get your ganja ready. And I also wanted to share about my hemp wick if you're not familiar with these. So if we take all the time and love and care to grow beautiful, safe, healthy plants, we want to consume, consume them and work with them in a safe way as well. So if you are using a lighter, they do contain butane in them, which is carcinogenic. So to avoid smoking butane, I'm going to be lighting the hemp wick and then using the hemp wick to light the plant. When we think about all of the elements of the plant, we have the ganja, which represents the earth. We have the fire, the element of transformation and change. We have the water, the vapors within our lungs that's going to be inhaling this plant medicine. And as we breathe out, we can send our prayers up to the cosmos, up to the heavens with the smoke of the ganja plant. And so before we begin, Let's uh, take a moment to ground ourselves in if you're sitting down or you can um, cross your legs if that feels good to you. Have both feet flat on the floor if you want. Relax your shoulders down away from your ears and just take a moment to let yourself land into this present moment. Notice your breath without trying to change or alter it and notice the breath without judgment. Where is it moving within your body? Is there a temperature quality to it? Are there any colors coming to mind? And just begin to refine your awareness within. Noticing what you notice. And keep your lips closed and try to invite the breath down into your belly letting your belly button, your navel, initiate the inhalation. As you breathe in, fill the pelvic bowl with this fresh oxygen, breathing into your wholeness, into your fullness. And with your lips closed, when you're ready, simply exhale out through the nostrils, letting your navel initiate the exhalation, drawing the belly deep into the back of the spine. Gracefully breathing in and peacefully breathing out. And here in this moment, bring to your mind's eye, to your Ajna Chakra, your third eye, what your Sankalpa is, what is your intention, whatever brought you here tonight to join us in this beautiful conversation in your journey of seeking cannabis, plant, spirit, wisdom, whatever your personal intention is, I want you to bring that to your mind right now. And then if you'd like, you can even whisper it. So we need to speak our truth into existence. So you can tell the plant what you'd like her to help you with. Seeing her as a sentient being, and I refer to her as a her because a dioecious plant. We have a male and a female and uh, the female that we're working with today, let her know what, what it is that you want. <laughs> She's not a mind reader either. So when you're ready, get our light ready and giving thanks. Om Shiva Shankara Hari Hari Ganja. With your Sankopa in mind, taking a breath in. and exhaling it out. Boom Shiva. And I'd like to share this meditation practice that I've been working with every morning. And if you're going to invite in a meditation practice, I encourage you to do it at the same time every day in the same place. So you can bring one hand to your heart and one hand to your belly. Find your breath again. As you inhale, feeling the hand on the belly, 
lift and rise as you fill your physical temple with this delightful oxygen. Let the chest lift and expand, the collarbones separate, breathing up and out through the crown of your head. And as you exhale, letting the navel draw back in, the chest lowers, the body contracts. Moving into your own natural rhythm of your breath, this divine ebb and flow. And as you do so, continue to refine that awareness of the new sensations, feelings, emotions that arise as you invite this ganja spirit on this journey with you. In this meditation, we are connecting heaven to earth, earth to heaven. You yourself, the divine vessel, like a tube of light. Breathing in, inhale, and imagine you're drawing all of the energy from the stars, from the sun, from the moon, everything above you. As you breathe out, let all of the cosmos come down, funnel through the top of your skull and into your heart. Dwell there in the hub of your heart and bring the tip of your tongue to the center of the roof of your mouth. Feel the breath move in and out, accepting this new energy from the stars above. Channeling in the Agni fire of the sun. Reflecting the light of the moon. The wisdom of all your ancestors that have come before you flow into you. And as you find your next inhalation, do so with gratitude for all that you are in this very moment. Breathing in to your wholeness, to your fullness. In this time, noticing the earth below you, Pachamama, Gaia, the great nurturer in which we sit upon that holds the soils beneath us. And as you breathe in, notice all the parts of your body that are touching the space below you. The connection to this planet, that earthy rooted energy. And from your sit bones, imagine your own roots, like a taproot drawing deep into the earth. The roots move like lava into the soil, into the sedimentary rock, through each layer until it reaches that molten lava core. And the roots wrap around the core of the earth, gathering that fire, phoenix energy, and it draws it up, 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 through each level, the rocks, the soils, the microbiology, the grass, the flowers, the plants, the trees, back up into you, into your vessel. All of the earth energy up into the belly. And there in that primordial soup of the gut, it sits. And now connecting the stars above and the earth below, noticing the hand on the heart and the hand on the belly. 
Let yourself close this loop with our next inhalation. Please bring the left and the right hand to the heart center in Anjali Mudra. Joining our masculine and our feminine, our lightness, our darkness, our wholeness, our emptiness, letting it come full circle in this divine union. And gently bow your chin towards your chest thanking the cannabis plant spirit for joining us on this journey for our trip is short and it's long and strange. And now with your next inhalation, slowly flutter your eyelids open, but keep your dristy gaze nice and soft and low down the bridge of your nose. And start to feel yourself giving such great thanks. You are the channel receiving and giving. And now let your hands open like a lotus, like a ganja flower, just about to blossom, like the lotus in the bud. And the fingertips start to separate and keeping the wrists together, like you're holding that sankalpa that you set at the beginning of your practice, right there in the palm of your hands. And now give it like an offering, your palms open out to the world, out to each other here in this beautiful container that we've built with each other tonight. And we give our offering out and then send it up, reach the arms up to the sky overhead, send it into the universe. And exhale, divine blessings rain down upon you, palms face down, but let them stay a few inches away from the body, just feeling the energy moving all the way down. And may all of your greatest dreams and desires manifest with divine guidance of our cannabis plant spirit ally. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a beautiful night.